Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Biblical Focal Points. This morning our message is going to be about how Bethlehem missed Christmas. <clears throat> Anne was working was a working mother in her thirties and one of the millions of women who saw the marshmallow castle on the December cover of a popular women's magazine and confessed later that she felt like a bad mother unless she made something from the magazines every Christmas. But the Marshmallow Castle was the Waterloo of her annual battle to be Superman at Christmas. The directions for the castle assured her that it was a traditional project that would add so much to a festive season and would provide the focal point of your holiday decorating as well. More than likely, the article also said the castle would be fun for the entire family to construct and tackled it by herself. The ingredients were advertised as inexpensive, <clears throat> but Anne spent much more than she'd anticipated and was off to a bad start even as she left the grocery store. The editors also claimed that the project was simple enough for a child to make, but Anne spent 10 frustrating hours putting it together. The hardest part for her was the turrets that surrounded the castle. The directions told her to paste peppermint candies to four vertical cardboard tubes with marshmallow cream. When Anne went to bed, the peppermints were holding fast to the towers. But when she woke up the next morning, they had oozed away from their stately positions. The castle was sagging. The towers looked exactly like naked toilet paper rolls and the peppermint slugs were disgusting. Anne's children wanted only to eat the marshmallows. And Anne's husband took one look at the white glob of goo, like the white glob of goo, and declared it the ugliest thing he'd ever seen. He didn't even want it in the house, she said. <coughs> Excuse me. The next Christmas, Anne was much more selective with her Christmas energy. This year, I'm going to spend that time with my children, she said. That's what they really want from me. Anyway, missing Christmas because of a marshmallow castle? It happens. It's possible to miss Christmas even as it happens all around you. The stress of finding the right gifts, of wrapping them, and especially for the paying for them, can camouflage Christmas so well it might just disappear altogether. It happened to a lot of people that very first Christmas, and nowhere was it more obvious than in the little town of Bethlehem, which slept through, right through the most important birth in history. Yes, Christmas came to Bethlehem, but almost everyone missed it. Bethlehem, however, had a good excuse. The people there were overwhelmed with life. An unexpected census meant the tiny, that a tiny village was suddenly packed to the gills unprepared for the extra guest. The demands for food, water, and lodging must have stretched the townspeople to the max, and the stretching probably went on for quite some time. To make matters worse, many of their citizens were surely required to be somewhere else at first. The business probably looked like a golden financial opportunity. In time, however, it just looked like exhausting work. But on top of the horrible schedule that surrounded the actual birth of Christ, of the Christ child, in time, by the end of the Christmas story, exhausted Bethlehem became overwhelmed with grief. The more familiar Christmas story is in Luke's record, but Matthew records the darker side of Bethlehem's Christmas with a paranoid king ordered a slaughter of children, a crime of unimaginable proportions. Let's take a look at that scripture. <clears throat> this is Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. I'm reading from the King James Version. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise man, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and at all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise man. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, 
and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. <clears throat> We hold a special place in our broken hearts for villages like Bethlehem, for people like those who lost their children. It was a horrible tragedy. It was terrible. It was an ancient version of Russia's nightmare in Bezina. When terrorists associated with Al-Qaeda seized the school building in 2004 and killed 338, including 172 children, we cannot comprehend that kind of terror and yet it happened in Bethlehem, and it happened in ancient Bethlehem. Yes, the residents of Bethlehem had the very best excuse to explain why Christmas came to them but then slipped away in the night before anyone seemed to understand that the shepherd's story was true. They had been overwhelmed with life. The truth is a lot of things can keep you from Christmas. A lot of really normal life things, and just as it did in Bethlehem, grief can steal the joy of Christmas faster than any other enemy. Dying is hard work. A friend with incurable cancer once told me, even as he prepared to die, he said he had not said he had not had time to consider the issue of faith in part because his time was completely consumed with medicine schedules, constant care, appointments with doctors and other medical personnel, surgeries, recoveries, and his most unwelcome house guest, exhaustion. Thankfully, he finally made the time to consider the Bible story and in the process of dying, that life in Christ. The sound of Bethlehem, it certainly was no Christmas carol. Bethlehem's cry it's a cry of grief, of pain, of sheer exhaustion of it all. And in the midst of the pain, they missed the song. And yet, there was a song, of course, over the skies of Bethlehem. It was a song like no one had ever heard. And had the residents of the village been awake, they could have been as amazed as the shepherds. Let's take a look at that song very briefly. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is... Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. The angel's message, they proclaim the goodness of God as if there had never been an inconvenience in Bethlehem or that there would ever be a tragedy there. They sang of God's glory and of a birth that would bring peace on earth over the very city where peace would soon seem like an impossible dream. It was a contrast of the greatest kind. In time, those who believed Jesus to be the Messiah would all understand that the announcement of heaven overwhelmed all other circumstances in Bethlehem, even great grief. Excuse me, I need to get a drink. The angel's song was worshipped at its finest. I think I've lost my place. Here we go. <clears throat> my, my friend with the terminal illness suffered great pain for a short season, but soon it was overwhelmed with the confidence that comes in accepting God's Christmas gift of grace. I can finally, I can only imagine what it was like 
when he entered heaven, but I'm sure at that moment his city of pain, his cry of pain, gave way to the angel's song of praise for the God who had saved him. So consider the angel's song. Even if grief has sapped your strength and left you wishing this Christmas would just disappear, relate to the truth and affirm it again, even if the pain you know today is like none you've ever known. First of all, God is always at work. Worship Him. The angel's song was worship at its finest. It considered nothing of the circumstances of earth and only considered the majesty of God. The angels had a view of God that completely blocked their view of anything on earth. And they sang as if God alone was worthy of praise. And they sang as if the glory of God was making a difference in the lives of those who lived on earth. Ironically, those on earth were so focused on their circumstances, very few of them caught so much as a glimpse of what the angels saw on that first Christmas night. The angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to all men on whom his favor rests. In other words, this is the best day the world has ever known. More than likely, Mary and Joseph missed the full impact of the angel's message. After all, Joseph was more stressed than he had ever been, and when his young wife had needed him the most, the best he could do was find a smelly cave on the backside of Bethlehem. Mary had just given birth, and despite the sweet refrains of silent night, giving birth is, well, it's giving birth. The labor and delivery must have been difficult. The shepherds were tired, both physically and emotionally. Financially, the shepherds were very near the bottom of the economic pyramid. The people of the village were packed into tight quarters, exhausted from the census and all the trouble the census had caused. For all of them, life seemed very difficult in its own way. If their life circumstances were the logical reasons they would give glory to God in the highest, then this would not have been the night for a song. Your circumstances are probably very different from any of those in Bethlehem, but perhaps it's a job that applies the daily pressure. Perhaps it's a relationship challenge that dominates your thoughts. Each December, it could be a schedule packed too tightly with things to do, things to buy, things to wrap, things to cook, things to decorate, things to eat, things to attend. You get the idea. Or maybe your circumstances have taken a turn toward the painful, toward the painful. Some loss, some illness, some point of grief has taken away any desire to celebrate Christmas or even life. Perhaps financial pressures has squeezed the joy right out of your daily schedule. If life is difficult or even too busy, it's possible to miss the truth of the angel song that broke into the night skies over troubled Bethlehem. In the midst of your circumstances, be they good or bad, God is worthy of your praise. God never changes, while circumstances change constantly. Therefore, God is worthy of your best song of love right now. And God's favor is upon you, even if your circumstances would argue that the opposite is true. And whether you can see it or not, God is always at work. The great missionary explorer David Livingston served in Africa from 1840 until his death in 1873. Pastors Robert Lewis and Wayne Cordillo tell of an incident from Livingston's life that illustrate the truth that God is always at work, even if we can't immediately see what God is doing. Livingston was eager to travel into the uncharted lands of Central Africa to preach the gospel. On one occasion, the famous 19th century missionary and explorer arrived at the edge of a large territory that was ruled by a tribal chieftain. According to tradition, the chief would come out to meet him there. Livingstone could go forward only after an exchange was made. The chief would choose any item of Livingstone's personal property that caught his fancy and keep it for himself while giving the missionary something of his own in return. Livingstone had few possessions with him, but at their encounter he obediently spread them all out on the ground, 
his clothes, his book, his watch, and even the goat that provided him with milk since chronic st stomach problems kept him from drinking the local water. To his dismay, the chief took this goat, and in return, the chief gave him a carved stick, shaped like a walking stick. Livingstone was most disappointed. He began to gripe to God about what he viewed as a stupid walking cane. What could it do for him compared to the goat that kept him well? Then one of the local men explained, That's not a walking cane. It's the king's very own scepter. And with it, you will find entrance to every village in our country. The king has honored you greatly. The man was right. God opened Central Africa to Livingstone. And a successive evangelist followed him. Wave after wave conversions of conversions occurred. Maybe we could put it this way. Even if life seems to get your goat, God is still at work. Secondly, God is always in control. You need to trust him. Did you catch the story of the man who tried to pass a counterfeit $1 million bill? It happened in October in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania. If it hadn't been a serious effort to make a fortune fast, it would have been a laughable prank. After all, there is no million dollar bill in the United States currency. In fact, there's nothing larger than a hundred dollar bill. And come to think about it, few checkout clerks in few stores are actually going to change to have changed for a million. Nevertheless, on a Saturday night filled with high hopes of solving all his financial problems, the counterfeiter made quite a scene in a supermarket checkout line, fighting with the manager who took his big bucks and very quickly rolling Learning, leaving the store in police custody. Okay, most of us are aware that it's silly to put your hopes in a bogus million dollar bill. But where is your hope? The Bible says our hope is found in Christ alone. Mary and Joseph were making great changes in their lives. And they must have wondered several times if they were on the right path. Mary's instructions had come in a mysterious vision. Joseph's instructions had come in a dream. As the months passed since those incidents, there was apparently silence from God. How many times had she wondered if she heard properly? How many times had Joseph seen the doubtful looks from those who knew about his dream on his decision to stay with Mary? It must have meant the world to Mary and Joseph when the shepherds arrived, breathless with excitement and filled with the wonder of a miraculous message in the eyes of the shepherds. Mary and Joseph reconnected with their own encounter with the Holy. Later on, international travelers would visit. Their eyes also filled with the wonder. There would be conversations at the temple with an old man and an old woman, both of them ecstatic with the joy of seeing a child whose arrival, they said, had been told to them by God himself. Those separate encounters began to build in their total impact by the time Joseph had a second dream, a few nights later, there was no hesitation in his willingness to believe or obey. He and Mary took the child and ran toward Egypt, trusting that God was in control at that moment, just as God had been in control leading up to that moment. Trusting God is the challenge of life. It is the essence of faith. The entire Bible is woven around this principle. Moses had to trust that God was in control, even as Pharaoh turned the people against Moses. Noah had to trust God, even though he had never seen a flood. Ruth trusted as she walked toward Bethlehem with, better, with bitter Naomi. David had to trust as he waited to become king. Jeremiah had to trust as he followed a trail of tears out of Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph were asked to trust God on the backside of Bethlehem, they were not in a unique position. Instead, they were simply two more individuals in a very long line of God's people who had been asked to believe that God was in control, even if they couldn't see the evidence of that control right at that moment. You in that line too. God will ask you to trust Him, to believe that He is in control. Be aware, but be aware of the truth the Christmas story gives us. Not everyone can make the leap of faith that is required here. The shepherds managed to make it to the birthplace, but no one else in Bethlehem did. 
the long timers of Bethlehem, surely knew that one of the prophets had promised that the Messiah would be born there. And more than likely, they quoted Micah's famous prophecy often. And yet the big moment came and went, slipping past Bethlehem, the way the meaning of Christmas sometimes slips past us. God loves us more than we'll ever know. In our culture, Christmas is all about the gifts. We spend billions on the gifts exchange every holiday season. And much of the joy of the holiday is in seeing the delight of a gift that has been chosen with care and received with delight. Christmas was God's ultimate gift. Jesus would later say that it was God's love for us that served as the motivation of Christmas. For God so loved the world, Jesus said in John 3.16, that he gave. And there's something inside us that has never gotten over that gift. <clears throat> Thanksgiving Day in 2003 brought the news that President George W. Bush had secretly traveled to Iraq to have Thanksgiving dinner with the troops in Baghdad. It was a stunning visit for the 600 soldiers gathered in the mess hall, and the morale among the troops was sky high. The soldiers had gathered for what they thought would be a speech by Chief U.S. Administrator Paul Bremer. Bremer told the troops he would, be, he would read the Thanksgiving proclamation from the president, then paused and noted that it was customary for the most senior official president to read the president's proclamation. Is there anybody back there who's more senior, he asked. Then pres the president himself then emerged from behind a curtain as cheering soldiers climbed on chairs and tables to yell their approval. The unannounced visit not only brought wild cheers from battle-worn soldiers, but also stunned the nation and even surprised the president's parents who had been expecting him at the Thanksgiving table at his Crawford, Texas ranch. By the end of the day, the soldiers went back to the business of war in a very difficult and dangerous environment. But it had made a huge difference that the president had come to them in the midst of their environment. The gift of his visit was the highest honor the president could give his troops. Christmas is the season to remember that God himself came to us ready to teach, encourage, and make a way for us to see our way home after our particular battle is over. The shepherds heard the song of Christmas and returned to the fields with a different outlook on life. The Magi were impacted with the child they found, literally changing their path home as a result. Mary and Joseph, already convinced that God had led them to Bethlehem, left Bethlehem with a deeper conviction than ever that God could be trusted and that the child, excuse me, <clears throat> and that the child they carried with them was the greatest gift the world had ever known. And through the ages, Millions more have found the gift, realizing that the God who is so worthy of worship, the God who demands that we trust him, is also the God who, first of all, gave us a gift, motivated by unspeakable love, so that we could know him personally. Charles Schultz found the, found the gift of Christmas coming to faith in Christ as a child and returning home after service of World War II with very strong Christian beliefs for a while, even worked as a writer for a Christian magazine. But he found fame, of course, as the creator of Peanuts, the most famous comic strip in history. Ironically, in 1965, television producers most turned away the most, most turned away the Soul's most successful project of all. With the, when the first screening of a Charlie Brown Christmas was seen, executive producer Lee Mendelson says that the CBS network executives hated the show. They said it was slow, says Mendelssohn, who, along with emanator Bill Melendez, told Schultz, you can't read from the Bible on network television. Sorch's desire prevailed, however, and the simple cartoon special garnered an unbelievable 50% of the nation's viewers that first year. It went on to win both an Emmy and a Peabody Award. Pop culture experts affirm that the program, now considered an icon, draws strength from its back to the basics approach. The ironic thing is that the program, which intentionally turned away from, materialist, from a materialistic view of Christmas, 
has become a huge corporate money maker during its 40th broadcast. It won its time slot in terms of total viewers, 15.4 million, and led all adult, teen, and children's demographics. It also earned over $56 million in ad revenue as companies paid over $200,000 for each commercial airing with it. Social's widow, Jeannie, is not surprised that the show has earned such large profits, saying Charles said there would always be a market for innocence. It turns out the song of Christmas is a beautiful one. Indeed, if people would only hear it, most in Bethlehem miss the song. Pain and grief and tragedy and busyness got in the way, but for those who were listening and for those who responded, the gift the received was nothing short of life changing. Every Christmas, the song plays with God's constant invitation for us to hear, to believe, and to respond.